Welcome everyone. I am Dr. Bharti Kansara, Vice President of American Friends of SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies, London University, and I am delighted to introduce you all to the distinguished panelists of our 13th webinar since the COVID pandemic began. Today's webinar focuses on the woodblock printmaking art of China, as exemplified by the artist Lu Shun, founder of the modern woodcut movement of 1930 to 1950. Lu's genius was to revitalize the neglected ancient art of woodblock painting, printing as a vehicle for expounding ideals of social change and national resistance. This exciting project is on exhibit at SOAS's Brunei Art Gallery. Mary Ginsberg is our first panelist and curator of the exhibition. She has worked at the British Museum as project curator in the field of Chinese and Central Asian arts. We are delighted that she is also a US SOAS alumna with an MA in Chinese art, as well as a diploma in Asian art. Mary will share with us her passion for bringing to light this little known but exquisite art of China. Her presentation will illustrate the revival of woodblock printmaking exemplified by Lu Shun and his school and how it relates to revolution and propaganda. Our second panelist and moderator is Dr. Malcolm McNeil, who is fluent in Mandarin and an expert on the arts of China. Malcolm has worked for the v &A, the British Museum and Christie's Auction House and is now head of SOAS's postgraduate diploma program in Asian art and he is also senior lecturer in arts education. His presentation will put the modern Chinese woodblock printmaking movement into the context of traditional Chinese arts and painting. Our third panelist is Zheng Haiyao, secretary of the Muban Educational Trust. Haiyao will talk to us about the excellent work of the trust which has made available to us this incredible collection of woodblock prints. She will also shed light on the Muban foundations and the Muban exhibitions and permanent collection. She has also worked at the VNA and Central St. Martin's College of Art and Design. As you listen to the three presentations and the discussion that follows, moderated by Malcolm. Put any questions, please, that come to mind into the chat box, and Malcolm will draw upon these in the 10-minute Q&A session following the panel discussion. The webinar will end with a vote of thanks by Greg Bowie, our wonderful president of American Friends of SOAS, uh, who will explain some formatting points. So take it away, Greg. Thank you, Barthi. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, in order to optimize your viewing experience today and to make sure you don't miss any of the uh, beautiful slides or presentations that our speakers have put together, I would just like to encourage everybody to go to the top right corner of your view panel on Zoom. Um, this will probably look different for each person, depending on uh, if you have updated Zoom recently or not. but in the top right corner, you'll see view options. Um, if you click that, there are there should be about four options that show up for you. And you can choose which one uh, looks the best, obviously, for your screen. But if you'd like to, to hide the speakers, then go ahead and click the dash or the, the straight line that will hide all of the speakers' videos. Um, or you can choose a single speaker, which will just show you one box of the person who's currently speaking. Um, and if you do that, then you should be able to see um, all of the slides very clearly. Um, so if you have any questions, um, feel free to put that in the, the chat box and I'll do my best to advise you. 
But without further ado, I'd like to hand things over to our first speaker, uh, Mary Ginsburg. Thank you. Okay. Um, good evening and thank you very much for joining us tonight. Uh, we're going to go through very quickly this exhibition which celebrated the legacy of Lu Shun who lived from 1881 to 1936. He was a social and political uh, critic who founded the modern, print cut, uh, the modern woodcut movement. He never made a print in his life. He was not an artist, he was a writer and social critic but he introduced the prints of the Soviet revolutionary printmakers and um, the European Expressionists, as well as the creative printmakers of Japan. And he wanted to revive the ancient Chinese art of printmaking as a weapon of social modernization and revolution. Remember that printmaking was invented in China during the Tang Dynasty and the oldest securely dated print that we have, the oldest woodblock is from 868, which is now in the British Library. Um, Lu Shun thought that black and white prints were a great instrument for this um, social revolution because all you needed were a piece of paper and some ink and a knife and a block of wood and you could make them cheaply and distribute them quickly. And so they were a great, um, a great way to, uh, to spread the revolution. And um, he liked the contrast that came with black and white. It was dramatic, it was compelling and he thought it would be the right message. It was an urban art in the 1930s, um, not necessarily appropriate for the 80% of the population, which was agricultural, but uh, that the, the woodblock movement changed and um, uh, became a popular movement as time went on during the 30s and 40s. So uh, Lucian wanted to use the black and white printmaking uh, for the revolution, but he also promoted the revival of traditional arts, including the 17th century techniques of multi-block color printing with water-soluble colors. We'll see both, uh, both of those types of prints tonight. So the exhibition was in four parts. Uh, the first was a homage to Lu Xun and his continuing aesthetic and social influence. We show portrait prints by artists of many decades and illustrations of his stories and some of his best known characters. The next section showed the long careers of 10 important printmakers. Eight of them worked from the 1930s and 40s through to the end of the 20th century. And we also show two artists from succeeding generations. The third section gives an extremely selective and abbreviated view of New China through its cultural trends and policy requirements after 1949. And finally, we have a look at the extraordinarily diverse range of techniques practiced by contemporary printmakers. There probably isn't another institution on the planet that could mount this show. Uh, the Met's collection includes about 7,000 works from every decade from the 1930s. Christer Vanderberg, who's the founder and trustee of the Mubon Educational Trust, discovered prints all over China during the 80s and 90s when most curators and collectors were looking at avant-garde paintings. Prints get much more attention today and the Met is still collecting, working with all the academies in China and directly with artists sponsoring an annual competition and commissioning works by young printmakers. So let's zoom now through about 90 years of prints in 10 minutes, I hope. Um, this is what you see as you walk into the exhibition and we declared our intention straight away to, to show two aspects of modern Chinese printmaking, the glorious art and the art of glorification on the left and the social and political function of prints as inspired by Lu Xun on the right. So the first section, which is portraits and book illustrations, um, it's, a, it's a rite of passage to cut and, and design a print, a portrait of Lu Xun. And this one by, by Li Chun is the oldest print in the exhibition from 1936. He made that print and sent it to Lu Xun who received it just before he died in 1936. Um, another one shows by Li Tai shows Lu Xun in a very typical pose. He's smoking, he's in his study. There's a print by Kate Kolvitz on the back wall there. And you'll see that the only recognizable book here has an image of Karl Marx. Now, Lu Xun was a leader of a lot of left-wing organizations, but he never joined the Communist Party. He has, however, been appropriated by the revolution and the Communist Party when it's been useful to do that. Uh, the next one by Zhang Jiawei shows Lu Xun in a very different aspect. Also, 
Kate Kolvitz on the back wall, Sacrifice, that print is called. Um, but here, with a heavy heart, this print made in 1981 is clearly a reference to the Cultural Revolution. And Lu Xun, like many Chinese heroes, has had a very varied and interesting political afterlife. Uh, the last one we show here by Liu Jing is a very recent print, and it's the only digital work in the show. So artists are still making prints of Lu Xun in every new possible technique, including digital now. The, the second part of this and the showpiece of this section of the show is uh, the illustrations of the short story, The True Story by Ah which is uh, Lu Xun's best known work. Um, and this is the only time that all 60 prints of this series have ever been displayed in one place. So uh, the story takes place at the time of the 1911 revolution and it shows all the things that Lu Xun hated about late imperial and early Republican China, the mean spiritedness, the inhumanity um, of China and the, and the desperate need for change. Um, and so here we have a few details uh, Jia Yanyan, who painted, who printed this series, is a master of the psychological portrait. And here you see three different views of our hapless anti-hero, uh, Ah Q. And I think you'll see more of that from Malcolm in a little while. This is another story by Lu Xun. It was his first story published in the vernacular. He thought that it was important to use vernacular rather than classical Chinese in order to spread literacy, which was the way to modernization and revolution in China. The short story, Diary of a Madman, the title from Gogol, of course, um, is about a guy who thinks his whole family have become cannibals and that they're all out to eat him. And you see the influence uh, continues of this story in, in the uh, big exhibition theater of the world at the Guggenheim not too long ago, some of you may have seen it, the installation by Gu Desin makes a clear reference to this story. We have eaten people, we have eaten hearts, we have eaten human brains. So the influence of these stories by Lu Xun continues. And finally, in this section, we have a, illustrations to a play by Lao Xie called The Tea House. Lao Xie, of course, spent many years at SOAS. He came in 1926 to, to teach Mandarin and wrote his first three novels while he was teaching at SOAS. Uh, the Tea House is one of his most famous works and it's, uh, it takes place during the period of the Chinese wars and revolutions of the 20th century. So we go on to the second section, which is called Generations. And you can see from these three periods, the, the, the uh, printmaking in modern China can be divided into three periods really before the revolution of 1949, so the war and civil war time. Secondly, the socialist construction period from 1949 through to the Cultural Revolution, the Maoist period. And finally, since the Cultural Revolution where um, art has become more personal and you have art for art's sake has returned, much less propaganda, much less political influence in daily life and in art. So you see why we call this presentation revolution propaganda and art. And it's exemplified in the works of many of the artists that we included in this section called Generations. There were eight of them who were essential to the period of the revolution. I've only included one here, Yanka Yang. I think Malcolm will show you some other works. Here you have this very critical work uh, in black and white before the revolution. Then you have this very optimistic socialist realism uh, work of the, of the uh, 1950s periods. Here during the Cultural Revolution when China was supporting the Viet Cong during the Vietnam War. And then finally this very impressionistic, not political work uh, from 1994 of Yang Ke Yang's. From the next generation, we have Jia Zong Zhao. He was propaganda and art. He wasn't part of the early revolutionary period but he was a master of propaganda in the 50s and 60s. And here you see this very skillfully done, wonderfully propaganda piece of uh, Tibet. He spent several years in Tibet and this was the, these works were inspired by it. Um, this is a double whammy of propaganda. People weren't actually covered with wheat during the Great Leap Forward. They were hungry and I'm not sure they were thrilled politically 
Uh, this is 1961, and remember, Tibet changed politically in 1959. Um, in the Cultural Revolution, he's done this very heroic masterpiece of economic construction. And then after the Cultural Revolution, personal, spiritual, his own discovery, very artistic. Um, you can see how he uses the wood grain to make this beautiful painterly piece of art. And our third artist of generations is Su Bing, who many of you probably know. Um, he did only work after the Cultural Revolution. So his work is very individual and very varied. This folk art style piece from uh, the 1980s when he was still at the Academy, these two works of art unusual for this exhibition, most of which are woodblocks. This, these two pieces are etchings, but couldn't be more different clearly. And finally, the work he's been doing since the 1990s, his major theme being the unreliability of language. And many of you have probably seen the book from the sky uh, or Tianshu where he carved 4,000 non characters. So they look like books, but they don't actually say something. They're all nonsense works. Then we go on to New China um, in the period of the 1950s, where the prescribed method of the prescribed format of propaganda was folk art. Because remember, 80% of the population was rural, a great many of them couldn't read, and it was important to show them a kind of art that they could understand, something optimistic. And these are called Nianhua, they are night Chinese New Year prints. It's a very traditional format. So you have a policy of being national in form, socialist in content. Then during the Cultural Revolution, we had the first two couple of years, 66 to 68, it was violent. It was largely those dark black, black, white and red posters, many done by amateurs because so many of the artists had been sent down to the countryside. But by the, uh, the early 70s, order had been restored. Many of the artists were brought back. And so although they were still doing propaganda, it's heroic propaganda, it's celebratory, it's about economic instruction, it's much more skillful and professional than the early years of the Cultural Revolution. And after the years of the Cultural Revolution, where you still have works of economic construction and development and optimism for China, it's a very different style of art. This is about the, the port of Dalian and it's surely about economic development, but it's very personal. It's much more manageable in style and intimate and using the grain of the woodblock makes these very aesthetically different from the kinds of work you'd seen before. And then you have, we go back to daily life in the arts post, uh, post cultural revolution, this very painterly style village house. And here something even as mundane as laundry comes back into art in a colorful and interesting style. Another important development was the rise of minority schools of printmaking and regional schools. Here you have the Yunnan school, which is of the, the Hmong people. And you can always tell their work by these, the very bright colors and patterns and figural representations. These are in Southwest China. The Great Northern School or Bei Da Huang School was developed by uh, soldiers who were sent to, uh, to the Northeast province of Heilongjiang at the end of the 50s, 100,000 soldiers were sent to develop the area. And they've made their own very distinct style of art using spectacular colors and the glorious landscape of China. But not everyone is happy in new China. And after the Cultural Revolution, personal comment was, was allowed and was more acceptable. This is a work by Zhao Yanyan, who did the series of uh, AQ that we saw earlier. In this case, he's done his own psychological self-portrait showing his experience during the Cultural Revolution when his students beat him up and put this terrible thing around his neck. Um, so it's about the Cultural Revolution, but you'll note the date was June 1989, which is quite likely a reference to the events at Tiananmen of that month. 
I don't think you need any explanation for what this is about. Su Xianping is a great commentator of contemporary China. This was a print that wasn't, uh, that was banned when it was originally published, but um, has subsequently been shown in China. And also we have various comments about industrialization, commercialization, overcrowding in China, and much of it looks very impersonal. Finally, a very quick look at some of the very techniques which are employed in China. Under Lu Xun's time, uh, the prints were, were reverse designed and cut and then printed with oil bound color. So now we see one artist, Chen Haiyan, who does hers right reading. So she doesn't cut it in reverse, but it's oil bound color and cut in relief. Here, Gao Rongsheng does also oil bound color. It doesn't look like a wood block at all, but it's cut in talio rather than in relief. Waste block or reduction printing is a different technique whereby you, you cut some of the, the design, you put your color on and you print as many as you're going to do in that edition. Then you cut some more, you color, you print, you cut some more, you color and you print. By the time you're finished, there's very little of the block left. And so it can't be copied, but neither can it be reproduced any further. And the, uh, the Yunnan school one that we saw before was also done by that, by that technique. Here we have Shui in the revival of water soluble colors and multi-block printing. They're very painterly. They're totally different effects from what you see in the oil bound uh, single block black and white prints. And finally, two Shui in prints by today's young Met artists. Here you have uh, a landscape with this very vibrant, very intense, wet color by Cao O. Oh, and on the right, He San Qing's landscape, very dry, looks like a painting or a collage and uses all the tones of Chinese ink. And I'll stop there and hand over to Malcolm, who's going to give you more, uh, more medium and less message. Thank you so much, Mary, for that, that wonderful survey of your your incredible show so I, I really um i'm thrilled thank you so much to the american friends of soas to to barty to greg um uh, for having me and particularly to to mary and haya for letting me share the platform with their their incredible exhibition so i i'm really positioning my my short comment here as a as a response to this this wonderful show having had the privilege of seeing it in person and so i picked out a few objects a few images that i'd like to encourage you if you will to pause next to with me and to to look closely a chance for us to to think about the not only the, the, the wide context that Mary has introduced for us, but the aesthetic potential of this often overlooked media. To spend a bit more time looking at the technical details, the mechanisms by which these artists created such a panoply of different visual effects in, in this common media with a deceptive simplicity of, um, of the woodblock. And, and also to think about the various ways this media and indeed some of its framing and staging, if you will, has been adapted and, and used for so many different purposes within this um, very wide ranging exhibition that Mary has so, um, so kindly introduced for us just now. So I want to start, if you will, at the kind of the, 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 the center of this space. If, if we were to walk into the basement of the Brunei Gallery of SOAS, then there are many other things you would walk past on the way there, but this is in a sense at the, at the core of the exhibition. As Mary pointed out, this incredible series by Zhao Yen Yen is a, a unique chance to see the seriality of Lu Xun's narrative of the Akyu Zhenzhuan, the true story of Akyu. And in looking at a couple of selected details here, I wanted to talk about how Zhao in the 1980s, in what Mary so deftly described as the kind of the mastery of the psychological portrait, creates an almost theatrical, almost dramatic staging for several of the events that occur in this narrative over a sequence of 60, 60 prints. And you'll notice that in some senses, the characterization of Akyu through these angular, jagged, almost sort of torn lines from the, the cut of the ink that uh, we see in the outline of his clothes in the, um, the way that the, um, the kind of the, the fall of his garments is, is put in this, in this um, almost sort of dilapidated manner here that gives us a real sense of, of characterization alongside these almost binary juxtapositions of, of narrative events within the story, that the image itself is capturing, condensing and focusing on discrete moments in the narrative, such as this rare moment of triumph for Akyu when he wins a great amount at gambling, but the next day awakens kind of confused and sozzled, unsure as to how he's lost his, his winnings from the night before. 
Um, there's also these, these poignant moments of um, isolation and marginalization where uh, Zhao in a sense adds something that um, Lucian does not always necessarily strive for, an agency of the printmaker where in this sense, there is perhaps a degree of sympathy that's evoked for us for the, for the character here, this, this lighting, almost spotlighting of, um, of Lucian, um, of, oh, sorry, of RQ at the, the center of this, um, this print here with these figures in the background staring, staring on at him from the, uh, from the table. Um, these, these kind of figures from his local village who look down upon and sneer on him, but yet he remains spotlit as a, a sort of tragic, but also perhaps slightly more sympathetic figure in the iteration of this individual print that we see here. Uh, but then the drama, the kind of culmination of particular moments, the ability to freeze and focus on singular narrative events that any pictorial medium allows us, but that perhaps the woodblock beyond any other allows a kind of amplification and emphasis here so deftly expressed in Zhao's final section, the, um, uh, the, the, this, these two final scenes where Lucian, having been sentenced to death for crimes he in fact did not commit, um, is paraded through his town in this um, immersive space of, of darkness and, um, and constraint. And then we finish in this almost explosion of a, a last flicker of light at the moment of his execution. So an incredible sense of, of drama that's achieved through the the printmaker Zhao Yanyan's master of uh, the, the line, the um, angularity of the print, the construction of, of a, a very dramatic staging that this media facilitates. If we move on from that, that, that first section, that, that we could spend the whole, the whole of this, um, this lecture really discussing that one series, but there's so much more to cover in this, in this very wide ranging topic, topic in this really splendid exhibition. And Mary gave us something of this already to speak about her generation section, where through the Muban's expansive collection, there was a chance for us, or there is a chance for us to see and think about the development, or in fact, perhaps development is the wrong word, but the, the changes that occur over an artist's career. And I want to focus in here on two works by Li Hua, this seminal figure in the, um, uh, the woodcut print movement, who has revolutionary credentials stretching right back to um, to the 1930s in the formation of the new woodcut movement with Lu Xun into a kind of senior pedagogical position in, in late 1970s and early 1980s. Um, but if we look at two works of his, of, of his relatively sort of early to mid career, um, his image of the long march on the left and catching fish on the right, there are these kind of short um, changes in history that allow us to think of his work not so much as development as, as completely contextually dependent as Mary illustrated for us. Thinking once again about the graphic potential of the woodblock, the image on the left here is stark, bold, and I want you to focus here on its, um, on its pigmentation, on the saturation of these oil-based inks on the paper surface onto which they are impressed. There's a uniformity, a kind of consistent visibility and solidity to this long line of people, of individuals in the, this, this heroic revolutionary moment of the Long March, here displayed with a kind of honesty and um, uh, and, and willingness to expose the abject and, and arduous nature of this, this event that perhaps would not have been possible in the 1950s in periods of, of uh, revolutionary heroism. But here this, there's still a kind of visceral immediacy to this print to capture a particular political message. Whereas this work from, the 19, from 1956, from a rare moment of um, flexibility and creative potential of, of Li Hua, um, due to changes in the political climate in which he was operating, we see what uh, we've already heard described as a much more painterly aesthetic emerging. And that, I think, is, is again looking at another way that the, the woodblock kind of translates between different kinds of media. And particularly the painterly dimension that I draw your attention to here is that evocation of a recession of space, not through the, the, the depth of, um, of a linear recession of a long column of individuals. Space is not defined by the composition in this image on the right, but it's that focus on the, um, the mastery of ink tone uh, in, in, a, in a Chinese tradition, a particularly painterly aesthetic in the dilution of ink, implying the recession of, um, of pictorial elements deeper into the, into the composition with much more ambiguity and uh, a kind of looser lyricism, if you will, in this composition of fishermen fishing with cormorants in Guilin. And if we move on now to another element of the exhibition, looking at the new China scene, again, this, this kind of tensions and juxtapositions that leap out at you on the walls of this show as you move around it. Um, Mary already showed us Lin Ling's um, celebrating the abundant harvest and pointed out the connection with Nian Hua, these seasonal images um, of, of kind of celebration that were immediately legible as being national in form and socialist in content. Here, it, through the kind of stark juxtaposition of these two works very close together on the gallery wall, we're able to see the, um, 
the, the kind of the contrast, if you will, between the bold fullness of this um, somewhat what, what is historically ironic print, I suppose, of these scenes of, of hyperabundance in a time that was actually a period of famine during the, um, the Great Leap Forward um, in 1958, seen through this vernacular imagery of peasantry and, and, um, and, and plenty. Uh, but then just a year later, the, um, the, the work by Wolf and that Mary, um, uh, I touched on, I believe also, in talking about the revival of Shuiyin painting and that stark distinction between techniques here. Again, a kind of the, the technique, the, even the, the, the materiality of the image is, is political. The, the, the dilution of, um, of the pigments reduces that capacity for the forceful and um, explosive impact of the more um, direct propaganda image on the left contrasted with the perhaps more introverted and subjective image of a singular moment of a child at play on, on the right. Um, but when we move on again to these, these later developments, I wanted to think about, again, the kind of the creative potential of media and material here, looking at two works that Mary also illustrated to us of Yang Ke Yang and City Life, Shun Ruo Jian and uh, Village House. And here, I wanted to, to kind of pull you all the way forward into the 1980s now, and to think not so much about the the history of the woodblock print movement, which is the focus of the exhibition, but to consider something of the, the new ways of thinking, the new ways of thinking visually that were available to these artists in this period, a time when um, access was increasing to images of artistic traditions from outside of China, and where we might even um, reach to, or to or reach to, to, to consider the possibilities of impact of influences such as Cubism or Italian futurism, these kind of strong angular constructs of visuality that would have been taboo to explore and perhaps less immediately available to Yang Ke Yang in the 1980s. Um, and I'd love to know if that was actually an, an inspiration for the artist's work there. And then certainly the image on the right, this blend of uh, water soluble and oil bound colors in village house. Uh, we see not the stark angularity so um, readily facilitated by the woodblock, but instead this adaptation of the woodblock media to create something that to to a kind of a, a perhaps a North American or, a, or, or, an eye, or the eye of most people in London is more immediately legible as something we might describe as impressionistic. These diffuse fields of color which blend and blur into one another and a conspicuous ambiguity to the pictorial structure of the image. That doorway at the center of the of the scene here, um, it it bends the space um, within it and almost contrasts that sort of expectations as to what we're looking at. It, 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 the pictorial logic doesn't have that immediate discernible legibility that is so characteristic of many of the propaganda images that we've seen elsewhere. And instead prompts us as a viewer to look and to look again, to fully understand what, what is contained within, within the print. But that, again, to contextualize that, that change, that kind of shift from the um, from the 40s through the 50s and 60s and 70s into the fluorescence or, or opening up again of, of artistic expression in the 1980s could not be more clearly embodied than in this wonderful selection of works by Yen Han from the Muban Trust, a Muban Educational Trust collection. Um, and I want to focus here a, a, on, on two elements of, or two, two particular prints within this. If we think about the, the kind of points of continuity and rupture, if you will, in Yen Han's work from his, um, uh, his 1960s piece, support the front line, um, an image that records the, um, uh, the, the, the communist troops in the Second Sino-Japanese War on the Taihang Mountains, um, arduously crossing these perilous passes, but contained within, again, that visceral, legible, tangible um, uh, construction of a particular pictorial scene that is so um, well developed in the visual rhetoric of the woodblock. And then contrast that perhaps with the, again, this, this play of ambiguity, this, this um, this insertion of color and I think even playfulness perhaps into the Great Wall, a link of peace and friendship that we see on the left. Here where Yen Han is, is no longer accountable to the, the same strictures and requirements that had, had been applied to him before. And in that choice of, again, this, this perhaps interest in, in cubism or futurism, certainly an awareness of different kinds of abstraction, which are perhaps, his, perhaps much more his own and shouldn't be pinned onto European artistic movements of earlier periods, but represent this, this new kind of, um, um, color, colorful geometry as a distinctive individual interpretation of a national monument, uh, which is very much a, a, a response to the artist's own creative agency in the latter part of his career. Which brings me on to my, my kind of penultimate image that I want to touch on here um, from the, um, uh, the final section of the exhibition on technique. And there was so much to choose from there, so many incredible displays of, um, of virtuoso ways of manipulating and using the woodblock. Um, but seeing as I'd partly been briefed to, to respond as a, 
as a specialist primarily in painting to this, this printed media, um, this work leapt out at me, Tao O's reconstructed landscape for a number of reasons. I mean, Mary has already touched on the, um, the, the use of kind of a wet color technique that um, uh, the, the, the way that it's, it's, its pigments are applied to the, um, to the paper surface. But I, I'd like you to imagine yourself in the gallery with me for a moment and think about this and think about its format presented as a hand scroll. Look at the measurements here. In its full extent, this is eight meters and 8.3 meters in, in, in width, if fully unrolled. So the, the way one experiences this landscape, and as is traditional, if you will, or as is conventional for, for many earlier landscape paintings and, and, and images, and prints also in, in Chinese context, is for them to be unrolled and moved along sequentially, almost like a visual progression through a, a series of, of, of spaces and imagined images. And here that, that choice to insert the woodblock into that and that format and that formula is another reminder of something that is possible in 2015 and that achieves this, um, this kind of synergy of, of print, uh, mastery of print technique with its discrete angular geometry in a way that does um, that, that integrates print um, in the tw in 21st century China into idioms of, of painting and, um, and, and elite, even elite discourses of, of landscape, but with that very quintessential almost kind of Chinese millennial approach with this angular structure that, at least on my first reaction to it, was, was more evocative of, of, of video games than um, kind of classical archaism. So again, a kind of um, this, this tension between innovation and also appropriation of tradition in an incredibly creative way for a work that, that for me was one of the standouts of, of the exhibition it tells us a lot about where woodblock print is going and, and where it can go in, in China and will go in the next few decades. But I want to finish with an image that, that again plays with the, um, the viewer's expectations in quite profound ways. This work by uh, Li Wenfeng, and we'll be hearing more about this, this kind of this group of artists at the end of the exhibition in a moment from, from Haya. Um, he was the second prize winner in the Muban Educational Trust's 2018 Printmaker Awards. And I, you know, we often say this in our lectures, but this slide, any digital reproduction of this image absolutely cannot do justice to the intimacy of the print if you were to be with it in person. If we were there standing next to one another in the gallery now, you know, you would be compelled to lean in and look so closely. There is a kind of how does he do this dimension to, to this print that, um, that causes you to look and compels you to look and look again. For me, having left the exhibition and come back to it, it's the one work that stuck in my mind and made me want to return to it and, and kind of to, to, to check that my memory was, was really consistent with what had been accomplished here. And as Mary told me when we looked at this together, this work is so um, exceptional in its, its refined, in, incredibly intimate detail of these intersect, well, not intersecting, but incredibly thin, almost gossamer-like lines that um, create a, a wood grain-like texture, but also build the structure of the mountain with an incredible nuance and detail and intimacy that, um, that almost beggars belief, is, is freehand carved directly into the block. Is that right, Mary? I think that you, yep. you told me that before. Yeah. So it's, it's not, it, it's a, there's a confidence and a, a capacity for, for this artist that is, if not unique, is absolutely exceptional. Um, and it's that, that almost, that ability to create a world that draws us in, these mountains are filled with mythical beasts and creatures and human figures that you, you only find on multiple lookings and revisiting of the image surface but also the, the kind of the evocation of, of different material and media. Um, and perhaps this is only my subjective response to it, but the, the, the thread-like nature of each individual line made this appear almost like a monochrome tapestry to my eye, such was the, the intimacy and mastery of technique. Um, and with that kind of sentiment in mind of this incredible new generation of artists that the Muban has been so instrumental in supporting, I'd like to hand over now to Haya to, to speak about the work of the Educational Trust today and, um, and, and to hear more about what we can expect to see from, from them and the artists they support in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Malcolm. Thank you, Mary. Okay, so um, I'm Haya from the Muban Educational Trust. So what I'd like to talk about is how we work with artists. So we have very, uh, very comprehensive permanent collections, but we also have the privilege of working with artists directly. So the best example of us working with the artist are the two portfolios we commissioned. So the first portfolio we were commissioned in 1998 and was published in 2003. So this portfolio including 60 artists of all ages from all over China. Uh, here are some examples which are all in, in this Lu Xun exhibition. So in, 
in order to encourage young printmakers from China and to discover new art, new talents, we started the Mu Band Awards in 1915. And it's a biannual awards. We had four awards so far, and we have over 600 uh, uh, young artists that submitted their work to us. So we have first, second, and third prize for that. So from this uh, um, 500 applicants, we developed, we commissioned the second set of portfolio, which we choose 18 artists for the second set of portfolio. Um, like the slides showed earlier by Malcolm, uh, Li Wenpeng, Cao, and also He Sanqing, the last slides of, of Mary's slides, they're all from our award-winning artists. So they were let, very little known in China. We sort of discovered them in a way through these awards. So I just like to show you some of the, when the slides come up, uh, we can, we can, I can show you some images of the second awards as well. And also I will show you the, a lot of people came into the, um, the, print, the exhibition always ask how these prints are made. So a lot of them are, you know, black and white prints just cut in one block. And but also a lot of colorful colored prints are multi-block prints, but the most intrigue uh, kind of uh, artwork are the uh, the the assembled prints use a lot of different blocks. Like Tao's, the final reconstructed uh, land landscape has like 130 blocks of those prints. And I have an uh, an example of Tao's work, which is um, which we can see how the prints was actually being made. Go to the next slides, please. So, so these are the two, two, yeah, we can go to this one. So He Weiming is one of our trustees. And, uh, and then, so this is the black and white. And Dong Jianshen is from north part of China. You can see that this is a typical mountain village. Next one. So this both artists are from Sichuan province. And one is quite, quite uh, um, detailed, uh, just, uh, realistic description of the landscape. The other one is sort of abstract. Next one. Next one. So Xu Bing, so Xu Bing actually helped us a great deal in the first portfolio. He introduced us to a lot of artists. He also recommended many artists. So this one probably is one of his last woodcut. And the Fang Li Ming and the two artists from next two slides from next slides are from uh, Chen Haiye and Wang Chao are both from Hangzhou, from China Academy of Fine Arts. So Wang Chao at that time was the youngest artist in the portfolio. We can go to the next one for the second portfolio. Yeah, next slides, yeah. Next slides. So this, the second portfolio which, which we have, so this is Guo Shuang. So she has an, a, a little um, print in the exhibition, which is the, 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 the market town. So this is a very personal print, which his, her brother is in prison and she hoped that she will come, the brother will come out a new person. So the second portfolio actually have a theme, which is called the regeneration. Next slide. So He Sanqing, this is a, a typical He Sanqing landscape, which we saw Mary's last slides, but this one has a, has a um, bronze vessel outside. Next, next slide. So Li Wenpeng, this is another of Li Wenpeng's my mysterious mountains with a lot of hidden immortal, immortals inside. A smaller version than the, the last slides of Malcolm's talk. The next, next, next slides, please. And Liu Jing, the cycle of life, um, which with uh, from uh, an infant to an old man. Next. So Xu Na, which is a, a, a beautiful town lady, so change into uh, the Taihu Lake, Taihu Rocks. Next one. So this is a reduction print, as Mary mentioned earlier, the Yunnan School. So Basically, you cut and you print, you cut and print. So this one has been cut seven times and printed seven times. And it's also the, the red colors means life and death and it's energy. Next one. So of course, year of COVID, we have in the second portfolio, we also have a, a mask in a plastic bag. Next. 
So Cao, so this is Cao is the one who did that reconstructed landscape, the green landscape. So this is his contribution to the to our second portfolio. So the next part, we will show how he actually made these prints. You can see the next slides. So first, he does the uh, the tra the drawing of the of the of the of the image. And next one. And he used very thin tracing paper, EMP paper, to trace out all the images. Next one. So this is all the images. Each image, each one will be one color on the prints. So this print has 53 blocks. And so each image is very carefully drawn and traced. Next color, next slides. So this one, and then this tracing paper was pasted upside down. Uh, face down onto the pear wood, pear, pear wood blocks. And then next one. So he's cutting the blocks and uh, uh, with the, each one of the individual um, images. Next. So this is all the images being cut on the blocks, but you can still see the blocks still have a lot of uh, uh, extra wood ar around images. And we can see the next one. So he needs to scrape off all the wood, which is the next slides. So this one, he used a different uh, tool to scrape off all the extra wood. Next. And then this is all the, um, the after the, the all the images being cut, those are all the blocks. So 53 of these blocks. Next one. So the printing. So I just like to show this printing technique. It came from this is a traditional Chinese printing technique. So this kind of printing technique started from the 17th century. So this printing table, you can see they have um, two, surf, uh, two sides with a, with a gap in the middle. So the left hand side, you put all the blocks there with um, um, blue tack to, 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 to stop it, to stop it moving. And on the right hand side was the paper. So the paper is doesn't move, and then the blocks move around on the on the left hand side table. So every time each block will be one print. So for for this image, he will need to do fifty three printings. Next one. So this is the color. This is on the left hand side of the table with the blocks, um, you know, uh, with the, with blue tag and with the colors on the side. Next one. So a lot of people asking, how do you know this? When you move the block, how do you know they stay in the right place? They are in the you know right register. So this is the register of the blocks, which most of artists will just feel it, feel it with, with their fingers. So with their fingers sort of um, on the paper, they can feel that the line is the right place. Next next slides, and so he printing with this uh, in, this um, equipment is called the bats. It's also like ancient, you know, haven't been, haven't changed for 300 years. Next slide. So this is the view from an artistic, from an artist's uh, viewpoint, which you can see the block on the left and, uh, and the paper on the right. Next slide. So this is all the 53 blocks. So this is when the artist sent all the prints to London to us, and then this is, Tao's prints with the 53 blocks and they other some of the other uh, prints with blocks underneath. Next. Yeah, that's it. So you can, um, so thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry about the slides, but we can come back to the. <laughs> thank well, you, thank you. Mary, thank you so much. I, I, we had hoped to be able to have a bit of a, a conversation amongst ourselves because we only have a few minutes um, uh, left, I think we should give all the time to the uh, to the audience um, at this stage, and so we have a number of questions that have already come in. Um, I'll take, I'll read them aloud first of all, and then I'll I'll post them to Mary and Hayao to respond to. Um, so the first question comes from uh, Yue Yuan Tiol, um, who asks, "What is the difference between Japanese woodblock printing um, and Chinese woodblock printing? Um, is there a distinction in technique and development here?" Um, move Mary or Hayao, would you care to speak to that? Hayao. Okay, so I think the Japanese, a lot of, so the Chinese colored printing started in 17th century. A lot of them are the Gusu prints, are the New Year's prints from Suzhou areas. So a lot of those prints actually went to Japan 
And so the Japanese, we Chinese always say, Japan learned everything from us, just make it much better. So I think that's the same with the, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, the, the, the color printing. But I think there is one difference. I'm not completely sure. I think we, in the, in the presentation I just did, we can see that we, the paper does not move, the blocks move around. Apparently there is saying that in Japan, the paper actually moves. So the paper is not fastened, not um, on the right hand side. I think that maybe that's slightly different, different from the Chinese one the, in printing technique. Otherwise from Tao's print, you can see that it's actually the color. It's very quite a bit of Japanese influence on that as well. I think a lot of Japanese prints came back and influenced Chinese printmakers later. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think I, I think um, I think um, the, it's very definitely the use of water based inks rather than oil based inks in Japan uh, is one thing. Secondly, as, as Hayao says, the system of registration is different. So I think rather than having all those tiny little blocks, which is one of the means of producing multicolor prints in China, um, sometimes what you have is a different block for each color. So you could have maybe 20 different blocks depending on how many colors. And I think the Japanese use that system rather than the one of using the band. different, the many, the, yeah, exactly. It's so I think that's system. part of it. And also I think very like, um, like in China where originally you had one person designed, one person cut, one person printed and one person published. Um, it wasn't until the 20th century that the, China, that the Japanese started the Sasaka Hanga uh, creative print movement, which is where, which, which inspired Lu Shun also. So they're, they're similar difference in techniques, but, um, and at different, and at different times, differences in techniques. Mm -hmm. Thank you both for the very comprehensive answers. Um, we have a, a quite a long question from Bain Asu, um, which I'll, I'll parse um, for you. Um, essentially, the core of the question here is, uh, how is the Muban Foundation, uh, sorry, the Muban Educational Trusts collection mm -hmm. formed? And how does it relate to other institutional collections, uh, such as the ones you alluded to at the British Museum, Mary? So perhaps Hayao could speak to the... So, the, so how does that I mean, form? So, so the, the founder of the Mubai Educational Trust was, uh, is called Krista Wunderberg. So Krista is a great lover of Chinese prints and Chinese rare books. So he started to, uh, to travel to China in 1998. He and, uh, and another founder who is Verena, Verena Berlinda, a Swiss lady. So they traveled to China for 17 times. And then so they basically they went through all the institute, the art, art academies in China, and then they went into the, the department. So they met with the artists, they bring a suitcase of new US dollars and they paid out in cash, and then they brought all the prints back. So we have 6,000 prints, the main collections from 1998 to 2003. So that's how the fund, the the the, play, the whole um, uh, collections formed, the permanent collections formed. Mary, maybe you can talk about BM and mm. and well, and, the the richness of the of the Mubans collection is what's so outstanding. So there are very few collections of prints from the 1930s, the actual original woodcut print movements. There is a good collection in Japan, which was. Uchiyama's collection. Uchiyama was a bookseller in Shanghai, he was a very good friend of Lu Shun's, and it was his brother who actually led the formative woodblock printing class that is the, founda the foundation moment of the modern woodcut movement. So the Uchiyama collection is in Japan in Hayama in the modern Japan museum there. Uh, the BM and three other collections, uh, one in Australia, one in France, and one in the United States, have excellent collections of 1940s prints. So the period of wartime China. Um, after that, the BM doesn't have very much from the 1950s or the 60s or the 70s until the Cultural Revolution because there was no access. Uh, it was Ann Farrow who later started collecting uh, Chinese prints and built up the BM's very good, very strong contemporary print collection post-Cultural Revolution. But the 50s and 60s and early 70s, it's the Mubon collection that really matters in this world, which is why we tried to show all those in those generations, those artists tried to show the periods that they went through all the different stages of the development of printmaking in, in 1949 to 1976 China. Thank you both. Um, we have time perhaps for one more question, uh, which comes from Lois Alpert. 
um, before I hand back over to Barty to bring things to a close. And Lois asked quite simply, is there a catalog for the exhibition, noting that, um, that she is in San Francisco? And perhaps I can add my own question to that. Um, is, there a, is there a possibility that this exhibition could travel to the USA, to where the majority of our audience are joining us from today? Well, 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 hi, Al. <laughs> Yes, there is a catalog. We also have a website, which is called mubaiexhibitions.org, which the, uh, all the prints are on that, that website. And uh, the catalog, which Mary just see, you can buy them on, on our website or you can buy them on Amazon. We can ship it to you to the US, which the, the postage will be more expensive than the catalog itself. And we welcome, we're open to any new venues. If people like to take the exhibition, we're very happy to ship them. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, yeah, it, it's a fabulous catalogue. I had no involvement in writing it and I am thrilled to own a copy of it. And while the postage may cost more than the retail price of the object, it is well worth the cost. So get yourselves a copy while you still can. And if anyone has, has any way to help and facilitate this incredible exhibition making its way across the Atlantic, I very much hope you'll reach out to, to Haya or Mary. And um, the Muban's uh, details are, are in the chat. And so now I'll thank you both very much once again to, to Haya and Mary for their wonderful contributions to today's discussion. I'll hand back over to Barty to, uh, to bring the event to a close. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really amazing. And I know we will find a venue in the United States to show this exhibition. In fact, I will get in touch with friends at the Asian Art Museum, whom I think will be just delighted to have this. The director is uh, Dr. Jay Shu, who is of Chinese origin. And San Francisco, you know, has a vast Chinese population. So hopefully we will have this exhibition in San Francisco. Uh, but I would now like to hand over to Greg Bui to do the vote of thanks. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Barthi. Yes, on behalf of our entire American Friends of SOAS Board of Directors and the SOAS alumni community here in the US, I wish to extend our most sincere gratitude to each of our esteemed and accomplished panelists today for participating in our AFSOAS virtual event series. Thank you, Mary Ginsburg, curator of the exhibition, Lucian's Legacy, currently on display at the Brunei Gallery at SOAS, and also a SOAS alumni herself. Uh, Zheng Haiyao, secretary of the MUBAN Educational Trust, and Dr. Malcolm McNeil, director of the SOAS postgraduate diploma in Asian art and senior lecturer in arts education at SOAS. The passion and expertise in this field of all our speakers is deeply apparent, and we're so delighted that you've chosen to join us here today. I would also like to thank my fellow AFSOAS board member, Dr. Barthi Kinsara, for organizing today's event. If you enjoyed today's discussion, we appeal to all of you to make a contribution in support of the exceptional academics offered at SOAS. There really is no place quite like SOAS. Uh, you can make a tax deductible contribution on our website at afsos.org slash backslash donate. Um, I included the link in the chat box here and you can earmark your gift for any purpose you see fit, including for the SOAS postgraduate diploma in Asian art program. Alternatively, as the Association of SOAS alumni here in the US, AFSOAS offers one scholarship annually to an American student in financial need to study a full-time one-year top master's program at SOAS in London. To date, there have been seven John Loyello AF SOAS scholarship recipients, and we would so appreciate your support of this initiative to continue making this opportunity possible. And finally, thank all of you for joining us for this enlightening discourse and for your interest in this fascinating subject. We greatly appreciate your time. Thank you very much, everyone, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for having us. <laughs>